Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. So some of these don't look anything like what you buy in the store. Some of them look like crusts or earth stars, stinkhorns, candelabra-shaped things. Right. But these are, these are all mushrooms. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp, and I welcome you to tonight's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Our guest is David Hibbett, professor of biology at Clark University. He's here to explain the wonders of the world of fungi, especially mushrooms, a subject that deserves much more attention. Fungi, as we're about to learn, are extremely important in nature. Who knew? This year, as a Grace Fellow at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Research, Dr. Hibbett is writing a book on the subject for the general public, but will have the opportunity tonight to become fungi literate ahead of time. Dr. Hibbett is a fellow and past president of the Mycological Society of America and a recipient of its Alexopoulos Prize. We are very delighted to welcome him tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Yvonne. And I will start because this is oddly enough, when we think of mushrooms in general, we think of going to the grocery store and getting mushrooms and it's part of a menu. Sure. But they, we understand, have a much more important function in nature. Can you give us a little orientation like what are mushrooms and fungi and so on? Sure. Um, that's actually a fine question because I think everybody has an idea of what mushrooms are, but they're actually um, not necessarily so easy to, to define. So I'll put up this first image which will show you um, a, a group of organisms that I think everybody would recognize um, as mushrooms. Uh -huh. So they have a cap and a stalk, and they kind of look like the thing that you would buy uh, in the store. Yes. So everybody would call these mushrooms. Um, but these are also mushrooms. So some of these don't look anything like what you buy in the store. Some of them look like crusts or earth stars, stinkhorns, candelabra-shaped things. Right. But these are, these are all mushrooms. Um, this is also a mushroom. This crust-like ah. thing that's on the underside of a log is, is a mushroom. And the essential um, definition of what a mushroom is is that it's the reproductive structure of a fungus. So it's not the entire organism, oh. it's just the part of the organism that is producing spores. Um, so we and think of the, the cap, uh, that cap thing as the mushroom. We know that has the spores, but this has the spores. Yes, this, this the this blue is, stuff. Yes, this is producing spores as well. So from my perspective, it's a mushroom, even though um, most people might not look at this and think uh, the word the word mushroom might not come to mind right, immediately. Right. Right. Um, this is. This is also a mushroom. This is a cup fungus. And so this is also the reproductive structure of a, a different group of mushrooms. Ah. So what I'm, I'm trying to show you with this set of images is that mushrooms are tremendously variable in their form. They, they don't all have a cap and gills and a yes. stalk. And in my work, one of the things that I've been particularly interested in is understanding how they change between these wildly different forms uh, through evolution. So the last slide I'll show you in this series is a pair of mushrooms that really don't look very much like each other at all. One, right, is, one right. is shaped like a candelabra, one is more of a classic right. mushroom shape, but these two are very closely related, and we know that by comparing sequences of, of certain genes that we use for doing systematics. I see. So one thing before you leave that is our mushrooms are all fungi, are all fungi mushrooms? Oh, absolutely not. So okay. um, the, the pictures I've been showing you are what uh, mycologists like me would call macro fungi. So okay. And that's what amateur mycologists and just people out walking in the woods see, uh, the macroscopic reproductive structures produced by certain groups of fungi. But there are many, many fungi that don't produce macroscopic forms at all. So they're uh, what we would call microfungi. I see. Um, they're very diverse, very important, and you never see them unless you're uh, looking 
um, culturing them from soil or using some kind of technique that would let you see something very small. Okay, so we have that. Then there are a few other little distinctions there. A toadstool, for instance, which, you know, yeah. we, ordinary people like us go yeah. out. Yeah, toadstool you know. has no formal scientific Okay. Meaning, I, I would think of it as a mushroom with a cap and a stalk, but, okay. but that's a, an informal term. Okay. And very quickly, we know about seeds and we hear about spores. So when they propagate, they use spores. What's the difference? Spores are a hallmark of fungi. Yeah. So fungi reproduce via spores. They're mostly unicellular. They can be produced sexually or asexually. Um, and I have a series of images here that give you an idea of how a mushroom produces spores. So you can pick a mushroom in the field like this, yeah. bring it into your home or your lab, and put the cap uh, upside down on a piece of paper. Like that. Like okay. that, and make what's called a spore print. So then uh -huh. a few hours later, you have this collection of dust-like material. And those are the spores. So the, the fungus is producing these spores for dispersal and for reproduction. So these are the spores of a macro fungus, a mushroom. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a, of a mold that produces tremendous numbers of spores asexually, and releases them into the air, and that's why if you leave food out, it, it will get moldy. So they function in a manner that's similar to seeds, dispersal and reproduction. Yeah. But seeds are exclusively the production of seed-bearing land plants, yes. and they're much more complicated structures. So this is a picture of a ah. pine seed, and it's several, it's, well, many thousands of cells. Um, in the center of this is a little plant embryo. Yeah. It's surrounded by nutritive tissue, and that's surrounded by a layer of protective tissue. So it's a m much more complex structure than, a, than spores. It's one of the great innovations in the evolution of life. Um, and they serve a similar function as spores, but they're not, um, they're not the same thing. Right, uh, and a seed might stay uh, dormant for a very long time, and some of them for centuries sure. and stuff. Can spores do that as well if they're frozen or whatever? Yeah, spores can, can, remain, okay. um, can remain viable for a very, very long time. Ah. For most groups of fungi, though, we don't, we don't know how long ah, the spores last. I see. Uh, there's so much we don't know about fungi, like how long, how long the spores remain viable. Even though they have a very long evolutionary history. People are working on this. For example, we don't know how long the spores that are in the soil remain viable. Got it. Um, yes. Okay. And this is the sort of thing that can only be determined with experimentation. I see. Okay. All right. So now we have, anyway, spores and seeds. Spores, would you say, are are more primitive than seeds, or they're just different? Algae and plants yeah. have structures that we call spores. So there are, yeah. there are plants that reproduce via, via spores. Um, they're not, um, to use a somewhat technical term, they're not homologous to the spores uh, of fungi. I see. Um, the seed really is a very special invention in the history of life. Yeah, it yeah I think it's. I think it's not necessarily appropriate to, to uh, say that spores are more primitive than seeds. Right, um, okay, they that's are, what I wanted to. You know, the, the, the fungi that produce spores are, that exist around us today are equally as modern as any seed-bearing plant, um, but, okay. but fungi have not evolved seeds. Yes, okay. In terms of the evolution with fungi, how ancient are they? Do you know? I, can you? Well, that's, um, that's a hard thing to determine as well because the fossil record of fungi, although it's, um, it's not absent, it's, it's thin compared to uh. that of other organisms. But we have, we have some very old fossils of fungi and we also now have the ability to perform what are called molecular clock analyses where we use uh, DNA sequence yes. information to estimate um, how long ago a pair of organisms shared a common ancestor. We have to calibrate the clocks with um, fossils, so we're still dependent on the fossil record to some extent. Um, but uh, we, we can estimate the age of the fungi, and although there's um, considerable ambiguity because the molecular clock methods have large errors associated with them, we think fungi are at least 700 or 800 million years old. Okay. So they're truly very ancient. 
Um, so they've been evolving alongside um, plants and animals as long as there have been plants and animals. That takes us to the next thing, which is they have an extremely important role in nature. Is that correct? Sure. And I wonder if you could tell us about that. Fungi are absolutely central in the carbon cycle. Um, they, fungi are like us. They, they can't do photosynthesis, so they can't make their own food. They can't make sugar from sunlight, air, and water mm. like plants can. Uh, so they need to eat. They need to, they need to uh, ingest organic compounds produced by other organisms. And that's a characteristic that they share with us, with animals. Um, fungi have a different mode of nutrition than animals. They don't ingest their food. Um, rather, they absorb it from the environment. Um, but they, nonetheless, they are heterotrophic. They have mm -hmm. to consume organic compounds to get their nutrition. They do that the sources of, of, of those organic compounds are other organisms, right? Plants, animals, other fungi, um, bacteria. Um, if, it's a, if there's a carbon source, uh, there's a fungus to, to, uh, uh -huh. to attack it. Yeah. Um, so fungi have to get their nutrition from other organisms, mm -hmm. and those other organisms can be alive or dead. Mm -hmm. If the organisms that they're feeding on are dead, then those are the decomposer fun fungi, the decayers. And fungi are the master decayers of, of um, plant matter. So they're the major decomposers of plant matter uh, in terrestrial ecosystems. So this is why you see them all over the dead trees and uh, yeah. things like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. I think. So this is a picture of some mushrooms that are leaf litter decayers. Um, you can see these, uh, these are tiny little mushrooms, but they're in the woods all over the place around here. So uh -huh. if you just look for them, you'll see them. And these are feeding on leaves, small twigs, etc., which is actually very difficult material uh, to digest. So you and I can't digest that because we don't have, we don't produce the enzymes that would make that possible. So leaf litter decayers are very important. Um, this is a wood decay fungus. Wood is a tremendously recalcitrant material. It's very tough. That's why we build houses and furniture yeah, out of it. And it lasts. <laughs> In, yes, it, it lasts, but if your, house, if your house gets damp, you know yes. that you can have problems with rot, and right. that rot is caused uh, by fungi that have enzymes that, are, that enable them to break down um, the plant material. So these are the decomposer fungi, and they're tremendously important in recycling carbon and yeah. other nutrients. Uh -huh. um, but then the, the other uh, major category would be the biotrophic fungi, and the biotrophs get their carbon from organisms that have not died yet. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we consider those biotrophs to be beneficial symbionts. We call those mutualisms. Um, and in those cases, we perceive that the fungus is providing some benefit to the living organism um, from which it's obtaining its nutrition. Is this like the tree roots and so yeah, on or am exactly. I Exactly, so this is okay. an image of uh, a mycorrhizal fungus. So the, the mushroom on the right mm -hmm. um, is um, it's a heterotroph like us. It has to get its carbon from another living source. And the living source that it's getting its carbon from is a tree. So ah. the pine tree on the left is providing sugars to the mushroom. Uh, and the interface, which is on the lower left there, is yeah. called a mycorrhiza, which means fungus root. So this is a fungus that is getting, getting its nutrition from the plant, and it's reciprocating by helping the plant acquire mineral nutrients from the soil uh, and maybe water and, and other benefits. So we perceive this to be a mutualism because yeah. there's mutual benefit, but there's also conflict of interest here as well. Each one of these partners is trying to maximize its fitness um, at the expense of the other. So these, uh, these selfish. <laughs> well, there's a it's a it's a symbiotic relationship, yes, and yes. There's a, there is a conflict. Uh, of interests. So mycorrhizal mushrooms like the one on the screen here yeah. are very conspicuous. They include some of our most famous wild collected edibles as well as some poisonous things. They're, they're very conspicuous, but there's a much more uh, widespread group of mycorrhizal mutualisms which are called arbuscular mycorrhiza. And these are um, representatives of those kinds of fungi that don't produce a mushroom. So these are spores of arbuscular mycorrhizal, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi on the screen here. 
Um, and you will never see a mushroom produced uh, by, these, by these fungi. Uh, but they form associations with, we think, roughly 80% of all land plants. Uh -huh. So they're tremendously diverse, tremendously important in contemporary ecosystems. And we also think there's a, a suggestion that's been made that these organisms and the symbiosis that they uh, facilitate was, was critical for letting land plants colonize uh, the earth. Uh, to move from aquatic systems onto the oh, land. Isn't that interesting? Now these are underground. These are uh, underground, <laughs> right. So they're associated with plant roots. The spores are produced mm -hmm. underground. There's no above ground structure at all. They're all around us all the time. They're tremendously important and you will never see them. Right, and I just want to get this clear, very, very clear that the plants that they associate with they, the plants depend on them for some kind of nutrients Absolutely. that they provide the, uh, the, the process, the chemical process right. of the, the plant. Fung the fungus is made of, um, <clears throat> the body of a fungus is made of tiny filaments called hyphae. They radiate out into the soil. They have a very high surface area, so they're very good at absorbing uh, materials from the environment because that's what they do. They have absorptive nutrition. And so because they have this high surface area, they amplify the surface area effectively of the plant roots. And so they're able to absorb mineral nutrients from the soil that are limiting for the plant and, and provide those to the plant. And in return, they're getting carbo carbohydrates, sugars uh, from see. the plant. I see. So yeah. these, are, these are the happy symbioses. These are yeah. the symbioses where we perceive that there's mutual benefit, yeah. but there are also other biotrophic uh -oh. associations where uh, it's clearly antagonistic. So there are many plant, plant and animal pathogens. So um, this is an example of a, of a plant pathogenic fungus that's common around here. It's called the cedar apple gall. And in the springtime, you will see these, these gooey gelatinous structures formed on juniper trees around here. Uh, so this is an example of one of the very many plant pathogenic mm -hmm. fungi which are um, of profound economic importance. Um, so this is an example of a plant pathogen. Um, this is a fungus that is a, a wood decayer. This is the oyster mushroom, a delicious edible oh, mushroom. Yes. Um, this is getting its carbon uh, by digesting wood, which as I said is a very hard mm -hmm. thing to mm -hmm. do. Wood turns out to be a very low nitrogen environment, so nitrogen is limiting for these fungi. So if you look, if you culture these things in the lab on special agar, they'll produce um, hyphae, these filaments, on the agar plate. And this fungus, you can see here, this is one of the fungal filaments, one of the fungal hyphae. This is actually producing a little droplet of a neurotoxin um, that has the function of paralyzing nematodes, these little worm-like oh, animals sake, yeah. that are absolutely ubiquitous. Yes. Nematodes are everywhere. This fungus has a mechanism for paralyzing nematodes and then growing into the body of the nematode and eating it, and presumably it's doing that to get at the nitrogen. Mm -hmm, so this is a mm -hmm, fungus mm -hmm. that acts as a decomposer and also um, as a, uh, a predatory fungus. And this is just one of many fungi um, that eat nematodes, so the the habit of eating nematodes has oh, has, poor has nematodes, evolved repeatedly. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And we mycologists absolutely love fungi that attack animals. Um, <laughs> and this is another example. This is something called cordyceps. This is growing out of the body of an insect. So this is the, you could call this a mushroom, I suppose. It's the reproductive structure of the fungus growing out of the body of an insect that it, that it is uh, This is, in th that background is an insect? This is an insect here. This is the uh, pupa of an insect that was underground. And if you're crawling on your hands and knees in the yeah. woods, you might see these little orange. This is on the very tip of, a, of my jackknife. Um, you might see these little orange fruiting bodies coming up out of the ground. And if you dig down, you'll find the cadaver of the insect Is it that underneath. something? And we humans, uh, we are also victimized by fungi. So this is this is Candida albicans. This is the this is the fungus that uh, is responsible for yeast infections, which affect uh, men and women. Yes. Oral candidiasis is yes. also called thrush. 
Um, so this is uh, usually not very serious. It's normally a commensal in our bodies, but under some circumstances it can become if you are weak pathogenic. Is dandruff uh, also? There is a dandruff fungus, mal malassezia, that? That, that grows um, on our scalp. Um, so that is also a fungus because, as I said, if it's, if it's a carbon source, there's a fungus out uh -huh. there <laughs> Ready uh, to and waiting. exploit it. But I see. Dandruff and yeast infections are annoying, but they're generally not very serious. But right. there are fungi that are very serious um, pathogens for humans. Um, this is one called histoplasma that uh, is in, inhaled, and if it becomes systemic, if it goes through your body, um, it can kill you. Um, and there are a number of fungal diseases of humans that are very serious. Um, and because fungi are eukaryotes, we are also ah, eukaryotes, are eukaryotes. Um, the drugs that we might like to use um, are, are limited. Ah, I see, you know? I see, I so see. So this, this is an example of a very serious fungal pathogen of humans. But yeah. there's some inhaled fungi that are um, associated with uh, bird droppings and things yeah, like that. Yeah, right. Um, that so there are some environments that are right. particularly dangerous. Right, and perhaps after these disasters, like after these hurricanes, that you might have very moist and uh, conditions sure. that might generate that. Sure. Okay, all right. And I wanted especially to get this information about this uh, symbiotic re relationship and their crucial importance in maintaining the balance in nature. Is that the way we should see them? I think you should see them as being absolutely critical in a couple of ways. One is that they are um, a main mediator of the carbon cycle. Yes. So fungi are, are digesting uh, carbon compounds and releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So they're a critical link in, 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 in the carbon cycle, which as we all know is, is very important because uh, right. atmospheric balance of, of um, of CO2 is so important to the, right, to the planet. Right, right. So they're important in the carbon cycle. They're important as decomposers. They release nutrients into the environment. They make nutrients available to other organisms. Um, they also, through their activities as biotrophs, uh, they have large impacts on ecosystems. So these mycorrhizal fungi are critical to plant health. Um, plant and animal pathogenic fungi play very important roles in regulating the populations of other of other organisms. They have huge economic impacts. Um, we had a big gypsy moth outbreak this year. Yeah. And one of the things that we were hoping for was that if there was a cool, damp spring, there's a fungus that can limit the uh, populations of gypsy moths. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, and so that's just one small example yes. of how fungi have very large uh, ecological impacts. Right. Uh, I do, when you have peculiar weather, like a spring that's very hot or dry or something or other, are there fungi that then, say, attack uh, a lot of trees, fungi that can take advantage of that, or do we see large-scale destruction then? Um, I think the most famous example of that would be not with fungi, but with a fungus-like organism. This is Phytophthora infestans, which is the, uh, the potato blight fungus, the late blight of potato. Um, and in the mid-19th century, there was a period in Ireland where you had yes, several, several particularly cool, wet summers, uh, and that facilitated the spread of this fungus-like organism, which but is not- But it was fungus-like. Well, it's, it's, it's filamentous, it's a plant pathogen, so in, in those regards, it looks like a fungus. I we see. call these things oomycetes, and the mycete part tells you that we used to think it was a fungus. Um, but that's the most famous example, I think, of a, uh, uh, a circumstance where environmental conditions had very large impacts on, yeah. on um, ultimately, uh, human economies because because of the growth of this this one fungus like organism. Right, right. Um, before we close up, I'd like to ask at some point, like, how did you ever get into this? <laughs> because there are not a lot of people in yeah, this field, yeah. and it's fascinating. Well, I um, I went to UMass Amherst as an undergraduate, and I majored in botany. Uh, and I took all the botanical courses I could, including one mycology course. Uh -huh. uh, and then when I went to graduate school, I also was studying botany, and I was in a, in a program that had lots of different botanical subjects, one of which was mycology. I, and I just, 
I had always been interested in fungi, and even though I didn't go to graduate school for the purpose of studying yeah. fungi, um, I just sort of fell into it. Um, but I've always been interested in nature yeah. and and plants and plant-like organisms, algae, right. fungi, uh, et cetera. Um, and so that that's how that's how I got into it. Well, and uh, you would think this would be that it would spread the interest in this. I hope spreads because it plays it's such a vital role. And I guess one of the reasons why maybe people are getting more interested in it is that there has been a lot of destruction of the soil, often as a result of. Uh, factory farming, the, the industrial type farming, which is right. really upsetting the soil, and these things are essential to the health of the soil. Sure. It, do you know anything? Do you think that that is true, that that's going to be a problem? I uh, think with most fungi, um, we, don't, we don't necessarily know what we've got. Um, there are about 135,000 described species of fungi, and that's a very large number. Yes. But the actual number is a matter of, of conjecture. There was, for a long time, there was an estimate of one and a half million species. Um, more recently, people are talking about five million species. Uh, there was recently a very serious analysis published where somebody suggested that there could be 160 million species of oh, fungi. We so we, we really have no idea what the diversity of fungi is on the planet, particularly these microfungi that don't make mushrooms. So. I think it's likely that there is massive extinction mm -hmm. of fungi taking place. Uh, I suspect that yeah. it's mostly due to habitat destruction yeah, uh -huh. and that sort of thing. But most of the species that we're losing, we assume, that we assume we're losing, uh, have probably never been described at all. And that's, that's a great tragedy. Yes, but, it is. But the, um, the gap between the described diversity of fungi and the estimated total diversity of fungi is so vast. And it's one of the things that I think is really wonderful about being a mycologist. Yes. There are so many discoveries to be made. Yes. Um, so I think it's a very rich area. I think there are right. lots of opportunities. Right. Um, and so maybe more people will get into this field now. Well, there, there already <laughs> just, are lots of is people that, that, so that are people interested. Are, yeah. um, and not just professionals, because yeah. frankly, um, you know, you ask me, how do you get into mycology? Yeah. It's not. Um, it's not a huge professional area. The Mycological Society of America, the professional society I belong to, has about a thousand members, which is not well, that many. Well, compared to physics or something, right? right. It's just but I think the group. Um, uh, but there's a huge interest in mycology among the public. So there are lots yes. of amateur mycologists now who are getting interested there. And um, you work with them. I do. I do. It's a it's a wonderful group of people. And here in Massachusetts, we're very fortunate to have uh, the, the oldest mushroom club in the country, the, yeah, Bos is that the so? Boston Mycological Club. And the amateur mycology scene is really active. Um, there's a lot of really interesting people. They're passionate about nature. Um, and I think that um, this is a group that needs lots of support from professionals like me. Mm -hmm. um, and this is these are pictures here from a mushroom foray of the Boston Mycological Club, our local group uh, that I'm involved with. And they're tremendous fun, and you can go out and see a huge diversity of fungi, much more than you would see if you were just out walking in the woods um, by yourself. Uh, this is the website of the, of uh, the Boston Mycological you. Club with their, with their UR, URL. Um, during the season, that is the summer and fall principally, um, they have forays every week, and so you can meet up and go out in the woods and learn a lot about mushrooms because many of the amateur mycologists are superb taxonomists. They really Isn't that something? Yeah. So I think there's there I think it's likely that there's more taxonomic knowledge uh, in the brains of the amateurs than among the <laughs> professionals because um, we professionals working in universities and museums are we're vastly outnumbered by the amateurs, and that's not a bad situation that's, that's, at all. It's wonderful, as a matter of fact, and especially if they really understand the important role that these fungi play. But anybody can check out and maybe yeah. go on one of these field sure. trips in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. Yeah, Massachusetts, southern New England. But there, are, there are clubs in New Hampshire. There are clubs okay. in New York. There's a North right. American Mycological Association that's a network and umbrella organization for all the regional clubs. And the people that come to these forays, um, 
they're very diverse in their backgrounds and their yeah. interests. Some, yeah. people, some people just want to collect edible wild mushrooms. Some people want to make um, dyes for natural fabrics with mushrooms. Yes. Some people are just interested in nature. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's all, all a, this variety. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an interesting wonderful. group of people. Thank you for sharing this information with us, and we'll make sure that we, you know we try to make this available to uh, the public. Before we stop, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to cover? Like to add? Well. One small pet peeve of mine, when you go to restaurants and people, and you see on the menu, um, this, is a, this is a pet peeve that I and other mycologists share, you'll frequently see um, items listed as containing wild mushrooms. <laughs> so I want to talk very briefly about what <laughs> wild you. mushrooms okay. are. <laughs> so the edible mushrooms that we enjoy, um, there are really two kinds. Um, there are cultivated mushrooms, which are decayers, and because they're decayers, we can grow them in really uh, high like density. That. So these are the button mushrooms yes. that you get at the store, and we grow them on compost. This is shiitake, which is a wood decayer. We can grow it on logs or on sawdust. But they deliberately grow it. Absolutely. Okay. So these are cultivated, non-wild mushrooms. Okay. The wild mushrooms that we um, collect in the field are things like chanterelles here. Uh, or porcinis, which, uh, is, which yeah. are delicious. <laughs> yeah, right. These are mycorrhizal. So these are examples of mushrooms that need to live in partnership with forest trees. Okay. And th because they're getting their sugars not right. by decomposing dead okay. organic matter, but okay. through these symbioses. These cannot yet be cultivated. Okay. And that's why they're so expensive. I um, see. So um, this is a plea to the chefs out there to <laughs> please identify the mushrooms that are in your dishes. And if they're shiitake, uh, don't label them as wild mushrooms because the, the few mycologists that come to your restaurant will be, will be very frustrated. Yes, okay. Uh, that's great information. And of course, when you write your book, then we'll, I hope there will be a chapter about this because uh, a number of things uh, are going to be uh, cultivated in the future that used to be wild. My first thought is salmon. I, I think that um, growing a chanterelle in culture is a far greater challenge than raising salmon in a fish farm. Uh -huh. um, so it, I think it will be a long time before and we have really factory be, farm chanterelles. Yes, okay, that'll, that'll be a good thing. Well, thank you ever so much, Dr. Hibbett, for joining us and giving us all this fabulous information tonight. When you, I know you're writing your book mm. this year, or do you have any idea like uh, when you will be publishing this so we can watch well, for Well, I have a deadline that my, my publisher <laughs> has set, and, and uh, I don't think I need to repeat that here, but I'll be working very hard uh, <laughs> to, to, to meet the meet deadline. It. What I'm asking is so we can start looking for this, say, in a year or so in the that bookstores. Sounds, is that it, we really right. Need this book. There are just no books on uh, well, for the are general many, public. There are many excellent field guides. And well, the field guides, the, but and that's, they're getting better because yeah. be, and they're getting better because we have this amateur community that is really quite sophisticated, uh, and they are demanding literature that describes the incredible diversity of mushrooms around them. So, we, so it's the so diversity, it's, but also the the role of mushrooms and yeah. stuff. I think what's what's missing is a book that is. That in the book I am trying to write um, will fill the gap between the field guides and the technical literature on evolution. Yes, that's what um, we that's that, what that, we need. That, that's the aim. Right, especially the, the 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 evolution and also where they fit in nature because that is just we don't see it. We don't see it ever. So we'll look forward to that book. I hope you enjoy Radcliffe this year very much. I am. We're delighted that you're available and again thank you. Thank you.